All right, welcome to our study on the book of Romans. This is the Romans Education Part 2, and this is Session 15. Now, what we've done so far is we have covered, we're still, we're still in this part of godly wisdom. That is going to be Romans chapter 12, verses 3 to 16. And so we just finished up verse 10 last time, which was that second core feature of godly love. And if you remember, that first one was selflessness, and the second one was loving kindness. And those, those are the two things now that we're going to carry with us outside of the local assembly into another area of our life. And so that kind of puts us all on the same page. <clears throat> when we started this education, by the way, if, you, if you're looking at your note takers, we'll start filling those in here right off the bat. In, in, in our previous forms of doctrine that we were looking at, we started this by the development of godly wisdom in our attitude toward the local assembly. And so you'll see that in figure one of your note taker there. And um, <clears throat> so it, to get ourselves started, what we're going to do is we're going to read this next section of Scripture, uh, and then we'll go back to the note taker. So let's see if we can read this together. Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 11. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality, Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice. And weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Now, each one of these verses, uh, and, and you'll see this develop as we go through the rest of these verses. By the way, I, I, I know that we were talking for a moment before we started the recording, and let me just say that this book that we are starting today is going to finish up this whole section on godly wisdom. So that means we're going to do that last lesson the first Sunday in March, and that means then we'll be moving into justice. And I'm just saying that to say that you know that you have that many lessons now to cover those verses that we just read. And each one of these verses is in a particular context. So back to your note taker, just as the previous doctrine was talking about our attitude toward the local assembly, this next one is, in verse 11, Paul is dealing with our attitude toward business or our work life, what it is that we do for a living. Now, <clears throat> you're going to notice that the instruction is about to change here. Paul is stepping aside. <clears throat> My understanding of these verses is, that Paul is stepping aside from giving us another feature of godly love, so to speak. And now what he's doing is giving us the places where this is going to be put into action with people outside of the assembly of which we're a part. So one thing I know for sure, all of this stuff that we were just dealing with, I mean, just look back at this with me, where he says, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope. Pay. This is not just a laundry list of motivational type things. Now, when you hear people talk about this passage, they always talk about this is what the Christian life looks like. But I'm going to take issue with that. That My issue is not that that's not supposed to be in our life. Here's my issue. That the way this gets taught most of the time is that you're going to accomplish that in the energy of your own flesh. And that is exactly not what you are supposed to do. Because even the lost world can do that. You're called to something higher than that. And so when we look at this, don't just look at this as a list, oh, this is what I need to start training myself to be more like. This is actually something now that is supposed to be produced in us by the effectual working of the word and the purpose behind our doing those things becomes what our Father is doing and what He has written in His Word. So ju just, just look at this not as a, a list of things that we need to copy into our life, but it, it is they are, they are opportunities to put what we have already learned in this chapter into practice. 
and that is godly selflessness and godly loving kindness are now going to move out from the local assembly and the first place that this verse is going to have you take this is where you work so take a look with me now and get back over here where we were and so let's look at verse 11 and take this verse on its own not slothful in business fervent in spirit serving the lord and so we see that the setting has changed and so what we've learned here is now going to go into our work life and let me tell you that your heavenly father has an idea of what he wants you how how he wants us to think about work and about business and that it's going to be carried out look you know what i hear all the time people who are in business they have uh, and look a lot of these folks go to church and they have trusted christ as their savior but they act like their spiritual life with god is one thing but when they show up at work they turn that key off and now they turn on the work key and now it's almost like i can violate all that because that was for church this is business and so you hear these little cliches all the time it's not personal it's just business well if that's what you need to say to make yourself feel like it's not personal i mean just go ahead and say that until the day it happens to you and then you'll figure out it's pretty personal but i don't want to get off on that what i want to get off on is to say we don't leave these things at our at the door of our workplace these are the things that shape our understanding of work and business so that it's like our heavenly fathers we act like god's not interested in that but i've told you for a long time god has a business and as a matter of fact even the lord jesus when he was here talked about it just that way before he ever began his public ministry when he's 12 years old and his family you know had all journeyed in for the feast day and now they're out and they're several days out and they realize in this big you know group of people that jesus isn't with them and so mary and joseph run back to jerusalem and what do they do they find him sitting in the midst of the brightest minds in israel and they are flabbergasted at his understanding and wisdom and so when his mother runs up and he says son where have you been we have sought you sorrowing do you remember what he says wish you not i must be about my father's what business he understands that his heavenly father has a business now i remember saying that sometime in a sermon we had someone visiting here that sunday and the guy came up to me at the break and he goes you keep talking about god's business and all of that he said where do you get that i said in the verse we talked about where even jesus talked about i must be about my father's business he said that was a 12 year old boy and I, I said who knew more than the greatest scholars in israel so you really think he didn't know what he was talking about is we have this idea that uh we can just kind of separate those things and they're not they're supposed to transform the way that we look at business and so um so we're going to do that we're going to take a look at what god thinks about business and how we're supposed to look at that and so that our thinking matches our heavenly fathers and um so we're going to find out we're going to find out that and i mentioned that phrase a while ago it's not personal it's just business because you are involved in business it does not give you the license to be unkind unkind or selfish those things are supposed to move right out of here uh, into the other th uh, areas of our life and our father means to permeate every single area of our life with the doctrine okay and so um there's some things here that you need to understand right off the bat as we get ready to talk about that and that is yes there are there this is going to bleed over into how we look at our co-workers 
and how we look uh, unless you run the business how we look at our boss uh but you know i i but but this really is going to start not so much with the people that we work with as much as it is going to start with how we view business itself and so having said that romans 12 11 is going to get us started down that road now our view of business our view of our work life if i'm going to take you back to romans chapter 12 and verse 1 do you remember what that is uh, i'm it's, I, uh, verse 1 I, I i'm sorry verse 2 at verse 2 and be not i gotta need to correct that in those notes i put verse 1 but really it's verse 2 and be not conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind the world teaches us to think about business in a particular way but it's not the way our heavenly father thinks about it and so we're going to have our thinking transformed by that and that and so the renewing of our mind doesn't just happen in here but it's going to happen out there as well and so um when you talk about business not everybody gets really excited about that um but folks we're going to be laboring with god in his eternal business throughout the ages to come it's going to be pretty exciting and i think one of the things that god wants to do is to get us thinking about business the way he views it so that we not only can prepare for what we're going to be doing up there by the the way we conduct business down here but i think we're actually advancing our skill set to be able to labor with our father up there uh, in the heavenly places and so he means for us to be directly involved in his business and indeed we will all right so we have an inheritance in connection with this business we know that um one is an inheritance that comes from just being part of the family the other is an inheritance that comes from being a joint heir with christ business is important to god that's true in fact he is the creator of it he is the instigator of business and up in the third heaven business is going on right now and i want to talk to you about that just for a moment to get us thinking about that because the angels in the third heaven are involved in industry years ago i did a little um uh, i did a little bare bones study it was just one or two i think maybe two lessons long um and i talked about some of these issues you'll probably remember them but when the bible talks about you know here is an angel clothed in linen white and clean and i talked to you about that and i said what, what is linen well linen of course is a cloth that's made from the flax plant which means you have to grow flax you have to harvest that and now you have to go through the process to turn that into a cloth in which now that cloth can be not only not only made but but cut out and measured and sewn together so that it makes this white garment now i i don't know how you know what i don't know how i used to think about that because i never thought there are fields growing in the third heaven i never thought about that there are farmer angels and i never thought about that there are textile industries up there turning those things into turning flax into cloth it didn't dawn on me that somebody is making and how would you make those robes one size fits all is everybody the exact size i mean i'm just looking at that and i'm thinking there's a lot of industry and you know there is a principle we've talked about this before that before it, things went on on this earth they went on in the third heaven first in fact when god created the earth he created the very environment that he wanted to have here because one day he's going to come and dwell in the midst of his creation right here on this earth so when you look around here and you see mountains and you see valleys and you see you know bodies of water and you see the beauty of all the 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 the, the vegetation and uh, and and all of those things hey they were they're all in the third heaven and they were there first 
And so God is duplicating the things that are here that are already up there. You already know about some of those mountains. They get named for you in the Bible. In the, in the mount of the congregation in the side of the north. There's one of them. And, and, um, when you, and, we, and, if you, and if you were to go to the third heaven, I know that we just think of heaven as just the throne room. You have this throne that is resplendent in glory. And there's one sitting on the throne with a bright light emanating from his presence. And maybe there's angels around it. And that's how we think of the third heaven. But the throne room is only one part of one building in the third heaven. You not only have structures up there, but you've got these areas that are not part of the, the city. And is there a city up there? There is a city up there. And one day it's going to come down and the new Jerusalem is going to sit right down here on this earth. And so there is a, there's, there's city areas up there and there's uh, country areas up there and all of the things that we see. And, uh, but the point I'm trying to make here is there's business going on. Not every angel is a soldier. Some angels are involved in agriculture and some angels are involved in textile or manufacturing and, and, and angels are involved in those kinds of things. The Bible says... Um, the manna that God fed the children of Israel with, that was what? Bre it was bread from heaven. Anybody else remember what it was said? It was called angel's food. Angel's food. Well, what does that tell you? It, and, and, it, and, and now Linda says it's called the bread of heaven. Does anybody remember the other label that it was given? It was called the corn of heaven. That made me very happy to read that. Do you know why? Because corn is my favorite vegetable. I love corn. In fact, Milton Barb and I were talking about corn. I was thinking, you know, people talk about bacon. Bacon is good, you know, and bacon makes everything good. Man, I'd eat pancakes if they had corn in them. I just love corn. I do. I do. In fact, I had corn on the cob last night. I just love corn. And so in heaven, there's got to be corn because from this corn, guess what they're making? manna and the angels are eating manna so somebody's got to be growing the corn see we have this idea that maybe here's what god's doing he's just snapping his fingers and there's corn and then he snaps his fingers again and now the corn is manna and you know where are you storing that or are you storing you know what what's going on with that i'm just trying to say when you start thinking about that the principles of business and industry have been work at work in the third heaven all along. And uh, so no wonder uh, that men, we, we think men came up with that. We think men were really smart and they had that idea. God passed that knowledge down and, uh, and it was going on up there first. So verse 11 is educating us in this issue of no matter what it is that we do for a living, there is a particular way that our heavenly father wants us to look at the earthly business that we are a part of and that's what this lesson is going to do <clears throat> now <coughs> as we work in business i also believe that the godly attributes that are supposed to be working in our inner man are also going to be having an impact on the people that we work with the people we um <coughs> that may work for us or the people that we work for and we should desire that and we should be praying to our heavenly father about that and we should be working to that end but like i said to you when i first started this was and even though that is true and that ought to be done the real issue in verse 11 is for us to get to thinking about business the way that he does so that our attitude toward our work and the things that we do at work can match exactly what he desires from us so business is an opportunity to put godliness on display to men and to angels and uh and to get our thinking aligned with our heavenly fathers okay now <clears throat> so the question is why does verse 11 more directly pertain to our attitude toward work itself rather than toward our fellow workers well 
the answer is found in that, and I put it in your notes this way, first things first. In other words, until we're looking at business the right way, we're never going to have the impact on our fellow workers that we're designed to have. And so with that idea, <coughs> verse 11 is getting us started, <coughs> making sure that what we understand and how we act are all coming out of the doctrine. Okay, so let me take you back over to your note taker, and you can fill in this next part. But just have this idea in the back of your head that until we adopt our Heavenly Father's attitude toward business, our words and our actions will never have the impact on our fellow workers that we would like for them to have. We'll have an opportunity to talk about that a little more later. And so <clears throat> uh, let's take a look now. The next area is the breakdown of verse 11. So there's three phrases there. And what I want to do is get you looking at all three phrases. So here's the first one. In the breakdown of verse 11, phrase 1 tells us what not to be. And the thing we're not to be is slothful. The second phrase is going to tell us what to be. And that is fervent. And the third phrase in verse 11 is going to talk about, oh, thanks, Linda. It's going to talk about our motivation. Thank you very much. It's talking about our motivation. Let me just put that up there. Our motivation, and that is serving the Lord. Thinking about business as adopted sons and daughters because it is how we serve the Lord. <clears throat> and so what I want to do is take these one at a time and, uh, and make sure that we understand what's there. This is really a pretty straightforward lesson, really and truly. When you read the verse on its own, you know, uh, uh, you understand immediately what it's talking about. So I'm not going to have to take a long time to, to talk about that. But I am going to talk about the mechanics of it uh, in the bulk of the lesson today. But before we do, let's just take a look at these, uh, at these phrases and what it is that we're being exhorted to do. So it's not uncommon, especially in this chapter, for Paul to make a bunch of contrasts. To say, don't do this, do this. Don't think that, think that. Don't, don't act like this, act like this. And, and so I want to give you some examples of that. This may be in your note taker as well. So take a look with me here. The negative exhortations. Romans chapter 2 and verse 12. Be not conformed to this world. And, and, and so you have what here, you're going to have what not to do. And then what to do. We'll talk about the to do in just a moment. In Romans 12, 3, where he tells us not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. So don't be conformed to this world. Don't think of yourself too highly. And then in verse 9, let love be without dissimulation. We talked about what that meant. It needed to be genuine. It, uh, it not, not just the facade or we're just acting like that. But real love is actually at work in us. And now here in verse 11, we get not slothful in business. So there's four of those negative uh, things about what not to do, what not to think, how not to be. But when you talk about these, I'm just going to run you through the verses here. I don't, you don't have this on your note taker. But when you talk about, well, if I'm not supposed to be, what am I supposed to be? And let me just take you through these then. So Romans 12, 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. But we know how we get transformed, too, because the verse tells us how. By the renewing of our minds, right? That's what the doctrine is designed to do. In verse 3, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. So it's not unusual, you see, for Paul to say, don't do this, but do this. Let me give you that verse 9 one. Uh, Let love be without dissimulation. And then what does he tell you? Okay, don't, in other words, don't let your love be that counterfeit, fakey stuff, but abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. There's what you are doing. And, and then in verse 11, here's what you have. Not slothful in, in business, but what are you supposed to be? Fervent in spirit. This is in the context of business. Don't look at fervent in spirit as though he is suddenly jumped out of the context 
and he's just talking about something that have anything to do with the workplace at all. So keep it in the context of, that's just been set in the first phrase. And so, uh, not slothful in business. So what does that mean? Well, let's take a look at the dictionary definition of persons, when you're talking about slothful, full of sloth. Okay, I would have never guessed that, right? Indisposed to exertion, inactive, indolent, lazy, sluggish. Everybody kind of understood that. And the antonyms to that, I don't know if I have this on the note taker. No, I don't. Uh, uh, are, you know, ambitious and diligent and zealous and fervent. Oh, wait, that last one, fervent? What's, what's, what's that next part here? Not slothful in business. What's the next part? Fervent in spirit. You know what he's telling you? Don't be this, be this. So I'm just trying to show you that Paul over and over again is using this contrast to talk about what not to do and then what to do. So I want to talk for a moment about slothfulness. It's mentioned 17 times in your Bible. Uh, 16 of those are in the Old Testament. That means there's one in the New Testament, and we just read it in Romans 12. Out of those 16 in the Old Testament, 14 of them are in the book of Proverbs. Jesus mentions it once in Matthew, and then Paul mentions it once in Romans, and then the book of Hebrews mentions it once. Now, these are the direct references to being slothful. But there's a lot of similar words that are mentioned in the Bible that expand that. Can somebody give me a Bible word that's really close to slothful? Don't be a, and instead of saying a sloth, don't be a, and the Bible says sluggard. Same kind of issue. So we, we, we see that. And so anyway, I don't want to get into a treatise. Everybody understands what that word is about. But there are, and I'm going to give you back to your note taker here, this, this practical reasons for not being slothful. And here's, here they are. And these really are coming out of these verses. And so let me just give them to you. And, uh, but I'm not going to give you all the verses that go with them. We are going to look at some verses in just a moment. But I just want to run through these. So the first one is, it's destructive for us personally. When a person allows themselves to become slothful, it begins to have an effect on them personally. Yeah, Linda. You don't have them on a note taker? Okay, hold on to that. Okay, well, let me just run through these then. That is great. What have I got left here? Seriously? Okay, so here we go. All right, it's destructive for our family. And I'm talking about dependence. If, if, if someone is not, you know what, if they're slothful, hard, hard to provide for the folks that they're providing for. It's destructive to society. When you, get a, when you get a whole society that now has tended itself towards slothfulness. Okay, I, I, I have my own thoughts about this, and I'm going to talk about them, probably regret it, but... For a lot of years in my life, look, I understand that before me, you know, the generation or two before me, they came up during the Great Depression, and that was very difficult. Uh, I, I, I understand, you know, that times were harder. I can remember my dad talking about, you know, growing up, his dad was a tenant farmer. Uh, they never owned a home. His dad never owned a car. And... Um, you know, they moved, you know, every few years from one place to another. They just worked the fields, and that's what they did. Um, you know, there was some, you know, tough living there. I can remember Billy telling stories about when her older sisters got married and moved up to the Panhandle, and they became cotton farmers. In the summertime, her mom would always ship her up to one of her older sisters, and she said, we just pick cotton every day. And she said, but with, of course, they're doing it with their hands, right? And she said, boy, that was a r real good way to tear your hands up, you know, uh, picking, picking cotton. And, uh, you know, it, it was hard. And I know that we've done a lot of things to make our life easier. Uh, but the point that I'm trying to make here is um, we kind of let the, swing, the, the pendulum swing the other way. And now we kind of have a society, at least big parts of it, they only think of leisure. 
And if the only thing that you're doing is leisure, you will develop those traits of slothfulness and sluggardness, and it will be destructive to the whole society. I want to give you, you know, I, I thought about going back and giving you this, but it really, I can just say it and, and we can move on. This happened in Rome. Rome was an empire that, you know, had, you know, conquered the world, so to speak. And um, boy, that, that whole society fell into that sluggard, slothful lifestyle where it was, uh, you, you, and all of that had a toll, and, and finally the empire fell. Okay, so let me just keep going here. Um, it destroys our reputation. And if you're a Christian, that if your reputation is uh, damaged by being slothful, then it also damages your message. People are not going to want to hear that. Here's the next one. Um, it's ungodly and it's thinking, living, and labor. Slothfulness is the very antithesis to what it means to be godly. And I'm not talking about them being... Uh, antonyms I'm talking about what it produces in a life it also hinders our sonship life you know why because your sonship life is going to take some effort and people who don't want to make effort are just not going to be very successful at being sons because it takes more than just punching the clock so to speak here's the next one it steals our future both here and in the ages to come. I promise you when we get up there, there's going to be plenty of people that were looking at wasted opportunity of what could have been, and um, that is, um, that's going to be unfortunate. And then lastly, in the business world, I'm just trying to bring it back full circle, it is destructive to our work. Now, having said that, I want to take this last part, and I want to teach everybody how to develop slothfulness. Because, of course, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to show us what not to do. But I titled it, How to Develop Slothfulness. So if you've got your note taker, I'm going to give you the mechanics of how to be slothful. And what I'm hoping is we'll be able to look at ourselves and say, Oh, oh look, do you ever see those progressive commercials? where he's talking about don't be your parents. Sometimes he's giving them a hard time for doing something, and I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, so what's wrong with that? I do that all the time. And he would go, yeah, you're becoming your parents. Okay. But you know what? I kind of like my parents, so it's okay. Um, <clears throat> this, this, idea of how to develop slothfulness you understand a tongue-in-cheek kind of way of saying if we see any of these things identifying ourselves that ought to be an indicator that we need to go to work on this so here we go and this is where we're going to begin to look at the verses so number one do only the minimum you want to be a fully educated son you want to be a fully educated daughter you, you cannot allow this to be how you live your sonship life, doing only the minimum. But I have also found that it is difficult to segment your life off and be really industrious in these areas and then in these areas not industrious at all. You know what it tends to be? You are who you are in the areas of your life. And so you can't you can't say, in my work life, I'm just lazy, but I'm going to be very industrious as a son. You may want it to be like that, but in the long run, it'll all seek its own level, like water, and you're, you know what? You will be what you are. So we're talking about here, my real main, I mean, I mean yes, the Scripture is talking about your workplace, because there's, if you're going to make an impact there, you can't be seen as that guy that can't work. And so you have to be, a, and, and so it's important to be able uh, to do that. By the way, not working, there, 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 there is a, 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 
I want to give you this illustration, but it's not important about who it is. But I worked with someone uh, on a church staff m many years ago, and um, they kind of got into this. They kind of got into the, it, look, we were starting a church and building it up, and it was a lot of work, a lot of work, a lot of hours, and not, not very many days off. But once we got that established and got that done, it was like this other person wanted to kind of let me take a break. Okay, and, and that's not a bad thing. But they, took a, they allowed themselves to take a break for too long. And they took a break for, you know, a year. And then one day, I remember them saying to me, I have forgotten how to work. Now, when you're working, it's hard for you to understand what that sentence means. The point that I'm making is, if you allow slothfulness into an area of your life, it tends to not only spread to other areas, but it, it, it has a devastating effect. Remember, I talked about this a while ago. It affects us. It, it's destructive to us personally because it is, becomes harder and harder and harder than to get yourself back in the work mode. And for a, for a country that often views work as a bad thing, that's dangerous. Uh, because I, I just have to be honest with you. I, I just wouldn't want a life with nothing to do. I mean, fortunately, I have more to do than I can get done. If God is going to let me live until I get all my stuff done, I'm never dying because I have too much to do but and I and I know other people do too and it's good to be busy and sometimes you can be too busy and then you, you know and then you have to manage your time but but my point is if you're going to be slothful make sure that you only do the minimum do just enough to get by let me show you a couple of verses here we go Proverbs 18 9 he also that is slothful in his work is brother to him that is a great waster now remember I told you almost all of these references are going to come out of the Proverbs. And so this is where we're going to look at. Let me give you one more. Proverbs 21, 25. The desire of the slothful killeth him for his hands refuse to labor. So, you know, so when I say do the very minimum, let me be more specific about that. Have you ever, have you ever, um, uh, I, I guess almost everybody here has worked a job of some kind or another. And so, you know what, at that job, you know, what do they want you to do? They want you to show up, right? And they want you to show up on time. And they want you to be ready to work when you get there. When my dad worked at Montgomery Ward, and he did a lot of different jobs, I can remember he was, the, he was kind of the Milton. He came in early, and he made coffee. So when everybody else came in, the coffee was already made. Now, I know not everybody does that kind of thing. I'm, I'm not really the Milton. My dad was. I'm really not. But because I don't drink coffee, probably. But um, anyway, um, it, 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 here's what you do. And, and you see this all the time. Come in as late as you can and then leave as early as you can from your work. During the day, do the least amount of work possible. Because of that verse that we just looked at, is brother to him that is a great waster. Waste as much of your work day as you can doing other things. Remember, I am teaching you, after all, how to be slothful here. So here's some great tips on how to waste your time. In case you can't think of any, here they are. All right? And so, and they're in your notes. So I've given them to you so you can always practice them later. Uh, talking to other people is a great way to waste time. It has the advantage of not only wasting your day at work, but it also wastes your co-worker's day at work. And so sometimes, and you know what? And I, it, 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 you know, I don't ever want people to feel like, you know, they can't call me. But you do understand there's a line there that at sometimes I just have to not answer the phone or I'm not going to get any work done, right? And if you're in a place where people are physically there, here's what happens. 
somebody shows up, you know, in the doorway and starts a conversation, and 20 minutes later, they're still there. So I'm going to give you the key. Now, if you're trying to be slothful, you're on the right track. There you go. But if you're trying to fix that, here's what you should say. Hey, I really enjoy talking with you, but I have to get back to work. I have to get back to work. And so if you're going to get things done, that's what you have to say. Actually, you know what I want to say is, if I'm wor- and I've worked secular jobs in my life. Don't think I haven't. I have. But when I do that, I want to say, I can remember when I, um, there was a, um, there was a company up in uh, North Texas called Video Land, and they had stores all across Texas, and we had a big distribution center where the corporate offices were and all that. And then a big company out of California named Federated bought, the, bought us out, and they took that over. So they not only had stores, they had stores all across the South. And so what they did is they, they essentially bought a company that did electronics, that sold everything from big screen TVs to... You know, all, ki- all, all, all kinds of entertainment venues and, 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 and that kind of stuff. And so they bought us. And so I was the director. I, I, was, I was the guy that ran the distribution center. And uh, I can remember sometimes somebody from an office would appear in my doorway and they would want to be talking to me. And I'm thinking, man, I got stuff I got to get done. And you don't want to be rude, but after a few minutes, you just learn to say, hey, I, I, we c- can we talk about this later, maybe at lunch, because I have to get back to work. But what I really want to say is, go ruin somebody else's career. Go up here in their doorway, because i got to get it done. And so, anyway, I'm just giving you both sides of that coin. So, if you you can be the guy that appears at someone else's door, you're wasting both your times. It's like you're doubling your slothfulness. There you go. Um, I... uh, Another thing you can do is conduct personal business during your work day. So, so a guy is supposed to be at work, but he's, um, look, I saw this. I, I, I saw this in companies that I've worked for. And um, uh, I worked for a company up in um, Plano, um, and they had, um, they had um, investment properties. And so um, they hired me to oversee the development of these investment properties because that was where the retirement money was coming to, to pay retirement for the people who had retired from this. Medic- it was a medical equipment company. And, um, and so we actually had a property in uh, Hillsboro. And so what we did is we took, and uh, I just need to say this quickly. Uh, we, we took a... Um, an old apartment complex with a uh, broken down blacktop asphalt parking lot with big holes and dips and cracked asphalt and a uh, pool that was not very attractive and an old uh, dilapidated um, laundry building. And what we did is we, we bought that apartment complex and then I uh, helped oversee the complete renovation of that. We renovated all the apartments, we put in new HVAC put in new carpets, we painted everything, we updated the appliances, we concreted the parking lots, made a gated community, gave everybody key cards to get in and out of the gate, completely redid the pool, put in that nice washed gravel area all around it, tore down the old laundry building, built a whole new laundry building, completely uh, 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 laser leveled all of those grounds out there and had it sodded and had nice uh, you, you know, plants put in the front and the flower beds. We completely redid it. And we got all that done. You know what the next thing that happened was? The rents went up. Because now you're living in a really not, actually, it went from being a very not terribly attractive place to live to being the nicest place in Hillsborough. The nicest. And people were calling, going, hey, Y'all got an opening? Hey, y'all got an opening? So the rents went up in commensurate with what you were getting. And then when it was really doing good, you know what we did? We sold it. And all of the money that came from the sale of that property went into another investment uh, for the retirement account. And so that was what I did. And so, 
my point is to say that I got to get through this. My point is to say that if you're going to um, be a good sloth, then instead of doing business at work, do do other things at work. I was I told you that story because I was going to give you an illustration of that about what it took to focus on that and to get that done and to move things along and and and, and all of that. You just don't really have a lot of time to waste, but. Um, do you know in the average business, and I know we're talking about offices here, but in the average business day, did you know that 40% of the day isn't spent on business at all? And I've seen that. I've seen that happen. Just think how productive we could be if we were actually really able to focus. So let me move you on down. Now, number two to be, a, uh, a, let's see. Did I give you that one? Oh, okay. Number two is hit the snooze button. And if you can, hit it more than once. If you're going to really be slothful, you could set a record on that snooze button thing. And so I'm going to give you a couple of verses for that. Proverbs 19, 15, Slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep, and an idle soul shall suffer hunger. Let me give you another one. Proverbs 6, 9, How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Now, if you can hit the snooze button, this is amazing. If you can hit the snooze button for an extra 15 minutes every morning, and you can do that five days a week, you will have slept, and in a year, in a year, you will have slept an extra 3,900 minutes or 65 hours. That doesn't sound like very much. But you know what? Turn that around and do it the other way. If you could work on your goal of being a fully educated son 15 minutes every day, guess what? That's a lot of time invested in that. Doesn't seem like much during the course of a day. And so think about, uh, about that. One more, Proverbs 26, 14. As the door turneth upon his hinges, so doth the slothful upon his bed. Now, I looked at that and I thought, what is that talking about? But if you think about a door, it swings open and shut and open and shut. But it, it just keeps going. But you know what? It doesn't go anywhere. It looks like things are happening, but really, really nothing is being, it's not going anywhere. So when you spend time in bed, and there you are, I mean, you know, the, the point is, when it's time to get up, get up, and then, um, and, and if you're going to be slothful, spend as much time in bed as you can. There it is. Number three, make great excuses. Now, you really need coaching on this one. Make great excuses. This is an indispensable skill for a slothful man. And don't forget, we're talking about work here. So you need to supply, uh, supply, uh, uh, apply this to your job. So what you need to do is get up late. And then when you're late for work, you need to find a great excuse for why you were late. And um, there's some great excuses that are used in the book of Proverbs. I found them. I'm going to show them to you. You might not be able to use some of these. You'll see when we read them. But let me just say that they're really creative. They're really great. So here we are. I got two of them that are very similar. Proverbs twenty-two thirteen. The slothful man saith, There is a lion without. I shall be slain in the streets. Now, out in West Texas, we don't have lions. But we have coyotes. So I guess you could say, I was coming out my door, but there was a bunch of coyotes out there, and I couldn't get to the car so I could come to work. And then again in Proverbs 26, 13, the slothful man says, there's a lion in the way. A lion is in the streets. He's saying, I was going to come to work, but I heard there was a lion in the streets. I'm not getting killed for this job. You're only paying me so much an hour. And so that, I thought, boy, that's really creative, isn't it? All right. So um, in this one, you know, kids do this. They have creative ideas about, you know, why they didn't do their homework. Everybody knows the famous one, right? The dog ate my homework. But see, that one's been around for so long, it's not, it's not creative anymore. And so if you're going to truly be slothful, you need to learn uh, the excuses. The more you have to draw from, the better. Don't repeat them. Your employer will remember, you know, if, if, if your grandma passed away and then next year you need time off because your grandma passed away, he'll be wondering why she passed away twice. So you need to be creative and, and you need to have a bunch of them. Okay. 
Uh, and, um, and, and by the way, you do know that really a true sloth, I'm not talking about a fake sloth, a true sloth has excuses for everything in their life, not just work. It's just, that's just the way that is. Okay, here's the next one. Don't have any goals. That's important. Because if you don't have goals, you don't have any direction. Let every day be uncertain. And, and, and that's the path for the slothful. Don't have any goals. Proverbs 15, 19. The way of the slothful man is as a hedge of thorns, but the way of the righteous is made plain. And so the, the, the slothful guy, he has no idea how he's going to go. He's just kind of playing it a step at a time. It's like walking through a hedge of thorns. You ever Back behind my house, we have all those mesquites that have grown up back through there. And if, you're, and if I'm walking to the back, which I've had to do a couple of times, back when we had Buster and he got out one time and he ran back through there and then he got uh, thorns in his paw and he couldn't walk. I didn't know that till we found him. We're calling him. We don't see him. The sun's going down. Billy's freaking out. I got to find this dog. And so I'm walking back through there. And you know what I'm doing? I have no idea how many back there. I'm picking my way through here because all those thorns i mean they're just you know they're just everywhere i'm pushing stuff back and moving through but it says but the way of the righteous is made plain knows exactly where he's going knows exactly how he'll get there that's the idea uh behind the goals and so if you're going to be a good sloth lack of direction very important uh if you're going to wreck your future then don't set goals because that gives you direction for your work and you can't have that and so and certainly certainly above all else i'm warning you here don't work from a checklist do not make a list do not let it be and we've covered this before but at night do not make a list of the things that you need to get done the next day i've worked many years of my life without a checklist and then i've worked years with a checklist guess which one of those is most productive i mean it's like going to the grocery store without a checklist you know what i'm going to forget the thing I was really going there for. And so if you're going to be a sloth, you just got to remember, be as disorganized as possible. That's important. Okay, lack of clarity is key. And, and if you're forced to do something, you know what? Um, just put it in your head. Don't ever write it down. That way you can always say, I forgot. That's a, that's a great one. Here's the next one, number five. Be poor at your work and never improve. Be poor at your work and never improve. I'm going to give you a verse for this. It's going to be Proverbs chapter 12, verse 24. The hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. So the rule here is a good sloth, a wise sloth, does just enough to keep from getting fired. That's the key. That's a, ba that's a balancing act. It's People think it's easy being a sloth. It's not. It's complicated. It takes skill. And, um, you know, but we have to crawl before we walk. And uh, we learn just to do enough so that we don't get fired. And then, um, uh, and then you don't have to care after that. Just, just figure that out. Um, also, uh, something else that's connected to being poor at work is um, don't do anything that would make others feel like you're good at it. Uh, men joke about this if they ever if their wives ever knew they really could cook now they're on the hook for it so you know what we do it's in the men's manual don't let them know you can and then you just fill in the blank cook fix the car put up put up shelves whatever okay number six complain about everything uh, complain about your boss, complain about the company, complain about your co-workers. Proverbs 26, 16. The sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. Do you understand? He thinks he's got it. So complain about everything. I'm going to tell you a story about this one. I may have told it to you before, but I like it, so I'm going to tell it again. Um, and then I'll give you a couple of principles and we'll move on. Um, there was a guy who was uh, one, of the, one of these guys. I, I used to call them motivational speakers, but I think they probably bristle at that. Um, they, companies hire them to come in and talk to their sales corp or, their, or their, uh, the corporate office, and they talk about how to get the company to be uh, more successful and more productive and all of that. And, um, and some of these guys are good, and they do know what they're talking about, and they have helped 
many, many, many companies turn themselves around. And so there's a guy, he's flying in, and he's going to get there just literally minutes before he's supposed to go on stage and speak. And uh, somebody on the staff says, hey, there's a lady that really needs to talk with you. And he goes, I'm, I'm not going to be there in time. And they said, well, she's willing to meet you backstage if you'll just take a minute. And so he did. He did. He, he met with her backstage. And so anyway, and she's crying. And, and he says, what can I do for you? And she says, she introduced herself. She says, I work for, you know, such and such company. Uh, maybe it was the company he was there to lecture to. And, he, and, and she said, I hate everything about my job. I hate my coworkers. I hate my boss. I hate my job. I hate my office. I hate everything about this job. And he said, well, let me just ask you a couple of questions real quickly. Number one, are you volunteering your time? And she went, oh, no. He said, do you get paid? And she said, well, yeah. And he goes, so you don't like that? And she goes, no, I like that. He said, okay, well, you don't hate everything about your job then. You, you like getting paid. And she goes, yeah, yeah, I like getting paid. He said, do you have a 401k or retirement? And she says, I do. He says, so you don't like that? She goes, no, I like that. And he goes, okay, well, let's, let's, let's write these down. And so she starts writing them down. And then he says, so do you, you don't get vacation? She said, no, I get vacation. He said, but you don't, like, you don't like that. She said, no, I like that. He said, well, write that down. Before he went on stage, she had 21 things on the paper that she liked. And, and one of them was, he said, how far away do you live from your job? She said, I'm, just, I'm only about 10 minutes away. He said, so you don't like that? She said, no, I, I actually love that. He said, well, write that down. So he got that. She got 21 things in her deal. He said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go home every day, and I want you to look at this list. And if you can think of something else that you can add to this list, add it on there. But instead of focusing on the things that you hate about your job, I want you to start focusing on the things that you love about your job. I'm going to wind the story up because of time, because my buzzer's already gone off. And to say that she got hooked up with him again a few months. I say a few months. I don't know. Maybe it was six months later. And she told him, she said, thank you so much for meeting with me that time. She said, this has changed my life. Since you met with me, those people at my work have changed so much. Well, we're laughing because we know exactly what that was about. And so when you complain about everything, it infects you. It, it does. And so... Uh, let me just say, the fastest way to destroy a relationship is to complain about it or to complain about the person. fastest way to destroy what you have going on in your work is to complain about your work. Um, you, you know, sometimes I get a call and someone says, hey, what are you doing? And I go, hey, I'm working, uh, I'm working on these books. I'm trying to get stuff done. And they go, oh, that's fun. And I go, actually, it is. I'd rather do this than anything else. And you know what's really funny? Is the person who's saying that to me, they don't like their job at all. So you know what they automatically think? Everybody hates their job. I love my job. I'm not telling you all this, but I do it for free. <laughs> I mean, I love this job. I, this is what I want to do. And, um, and by the way, um, if you want to be a sluggard, find a job you really don't like that will help you that'll, that'll that'll help move you down trail that one's free that's not on the list that's a that's an extra that's a bonus uh, okay and um and so here's the next one let me just move us on uh we did that one um don't manage your time or plan your day that's number seven and i've lumped number eight in with it do minor tasks and avoid doing things of value Make sure that you don't work on the most important things. Do little stuff. So I've had to make myself a rule. When I get up in the morning, look, <clears throat> just going to say this so that everybody understands. You know what? This is a process. You just have to figure out how to do it for yourself. But I'm going to tell you, I have learned that if I get up in the morning, if the first thing I do is I do the most, if I spend the next few hours on the most important thing I have to do, I am going to have a productive day. But if I get sidetracked, at the end of the day, I'm going to be frustrated because I feel like I didn't have a productive day. And so sometimes, now, I have these um, kind of navy sweatpants that I wear to bed and a T-shirt. And, uh, and, and so there have been days when I get up and because I have a desk in my bedroom, 
I get up and I walk right over to that desk and sit down and I go to work and the next thing I know it's 1130 I've been up for 20 minutes no I can't. okay did you get that that was a joke okay so I'm over there and before I know it it's 1130 and I'm still in my pajamas but you know what I feel really good because I've been productive what I try to do is to do other things first. So you know what? I get up and I realize, you know what? I got a message on my phone. But if I pick that phone up and I start going through the messages on my phone, I am going to get sidetracked. If I open up one email, I have now gotten myself sidetracked. And you know what I'm going to do then? I'm going to look up and it's 1130 and I haven't even sat down to work yet but I've been doing stuff but not the most important stuff now I'm not telling you work in your pajamas till 11:30. the point I'm making is focus on the most important thing so manage your time plan your day avoid minor tasks and get focused on the big thing that you have to do if you if you wake up in the morning and go what is my big thing you should have determined that last night and wrote it down on your list before you went to bed. There's a list sitting at my house right now that I wrote down last night of things I'm going to do when I get home today. Today. It's right there on the counter. If you broke into my house, phooey, if Zoe let you in the house, and you were to look on my kitchen counter, I've got a, pla a little planner there, and it's just it has no times on it. It's just it's my to-do list every day. And every night... I write down that list for the next day. And so I got some things done this morning, but I know exactly what I'm going to be doing when I get home today. And that's but and you know why? Because this next week, because I'm not going anywhere this next week. This next week, I have goals set for every day of where I need to be in the next book that we're going to be studying. Now, you may look at that and go, that's overkill. That's too much. But here's what I know. If I don't put myself on a schedule, we'll run out of sessions and I won't have the next book finished. So I can't afford for that to happen. So when I say do the things that have the most value, what we're doing right here is the thing that has the most value. It's funny how everything else can always get shifted to later. You know what? I can read an email tonight at 9 o'clock as easy as I can read it this morning. So I, I've been sidetracked. I've gotten my day hijacked before. And I always am frustrated at the end of the day. Don't. Now, if you're going to be a sluggard, you know, do minor tasks. Make sure that you waste time. Go, go hang out with somebody. Get on the phone and talk. Uh, do that. Don't manage your time. Don't plan your day. Don't make a checklist. Don't do those things. Because here's what I'm going to tell you. If you will decide to do the opposite of what I have told you here and you will apply any of that to your sonship life, you want one year from today, one year from today, you will be absolutely amazed at the transformation of your sonship life. I promise you. You will have made, if you will do this, you will have made, in your sonship life, and I know we're talking about work, but I don't need to, I'm, I'm, I, that was pretty easy. You have to show up for that one. But if you'll do this, if you'll apply these principles to your sonship life, you will go further in the next year than in all the previous years put together. And you know what you find out? When you see real measurable advancement in your sonship life, it motivates you to, con to continue. Okay, so I know I took a long time excuse me a long time with that but I wanted us to do that because uh, th this idea now you say well I, I thought you're really going to talk more about how your Heavenly Father views work and we are and we'll do that next week in the next lesson but I needed to get this out there to say that you know uh, I, I don't know anybody mm, maybe I've known one person in my life that just wanted to be slothful but sometimes we don't achieve everything that we can achieve because we don't have uh, a mechanism in place that allows us to do that. That's what I've tried to give you at the end of this lesson. 
All right. Um, that's, that's the end of this lesson.